19th of this year at the age of 83. She was arguably America's most beloved living poet. And I want to ask before I go any further, and, and this is, you don't have to do a, a show of hands, but, but you can if you want. How many people out there would call themselves like fans of Mary Oliver? We have some Mary Oliver fans. Anybody who's kind of familiar with her a little bit, but, but maybe a, just a little bit? A few hands. And then anybody who is like, who is this person, Mary Oliver? I've never heard of her, which is, which is great. So we've got, we've got the, the few. The diversity, you know, those, those hands weren't very, very high. <laughs> so that's okay. Though Mary Oliver was not a Unitarian Universalist. I repeat, Mary Oliver was not a Unitarian Universalist. There's no one else besides her who could possibly lay claim to the title of Poet Laureate of Unitarian Universalists. <laughs> Certainly, some of Mary Oliver's poems have been elevated to the category of sacred scripture among us. Let me count just a few of the ways. Three of Mary Oliver's poems appear in the collection of readings for worship that are collected in your great you know what you have with you? If you look, there's three of her readings in there. There's one by Thoreau. So <laughs> our church's Lectio Sacred Reading Group frequently chooses one of her poems as their sacred text. At the beginning of a class that I led just this past week at Carol Woods, I began the class by reading a snippet of Oliver's famous poem in Blackwater Woods. It was the one, to live in this world, you must be able to do three things. And it seemed that everyone in the class not only knew it, but read it along without having the words in front of them. And then afterwards, I kind of looked out, and it turns out that three people in that class have already indicated that they want that poem read at their memorial service. Mary Oliver seemed to be a poet of choice among this generation in their 70s, 80s, and 90s. And I recall at one of the services led by our U UNC Campus Fellowship, not this year but last, they chose readings, and their first choice was Oliver's poem, Wild Geese, that Linda's going to read at the end of the service. Because one of them said, we can't have a service without Mary Oliver. <laughs> Mary Oliver, it seems, is also the poet of choice among this generation in their teens and early 20s. And Beacon Press, the press which is owned by the Unitarian Universalist Association, is the publisher of 11 volumes of Mary Oliver's poetry. There's many ways in which I could have approached this. Her career is a career spanning more than 50 years. Her first collection of poetry, No Voyage, was published in 1963, and her last uh, publication of original poetry was Felicity in 2015. And I could do a lot of biography, but rather what I'm going to do is kind of share with you my experience of reading Mary Oliver. In 2017, I undertook a reading project. Over the course of that year, I read all 27 collections of Mary Oliver's published poetry. And in fact, I have a little, little show and tell for you here. Just a... There we go. That's some of them, and I, I saw him come in at the beginning of the service. I can't go any further without acknowledging um, Michael Smith, who uh, helped me immensely by tracking down a number of out-of-print volumes and rare chapbooks from the UNC system so that I could be an absolute completist. <laughs> and this experience left me with some fuller sense of her career as, as a poet, and that's what I want to reflect on, or what I will reflect on just a little bit today. 
The majority of Oliver's poems, and the ones that she is most famous for, go something like this. She beholds something from the natural world, an animal, a plant, a phenomenon such as wind or a cloud, and from this deep meditative noticing, this paying of complete attention, some profound truth about life, some profound truth about this world is revealed to her. One uh, person who's written on her connection between her poetry and religion says that she is a poet of theophanies, that she is a poet of God's revealing. And in her poems, there is this sense in which there is this truth revealed to her. If you look at the table of contents of just one of her collections of poetry, you find poems with the following titles. Rain, Goldenrod, Peonies, Gannets, Whelps, Hawk, Goldfinch, Poppies, Water Snake, The Egret. And that's just the beginning. Mary Oliver seems to have spent an extraordinary amount of time exploring the woods around her home in Cape Cod, and a lot of time, a lot of time sitting and paying attention. She describes this process in her poem, The Summer Day, with which we began the service. She says, I don't know exactly what a prayer is. I do know how to pay attention how to fall down into the grass, how to kneel in the grass, how to be idle and blessed, how to stroll through the fields, which is what I've been doing all day. That poem ends with the question, what is it that you hope to do with your one wild and precious life? Mary Oliver's answer to that question is, stroll through the fields, which is what I've been doing all day. As I read through her corpus, what stood out to me were the poems that broke with her usual style. They were so striking. So when in my year of reading around July I came across a collection of her poetry entitled Thirst, I was startled. There was a striking change in her poems. This was the first collection of poetry she published after the death of her beloved partner of over 40 years, Molly Malone Cook. And so thirst is obviously shaped by grief, but it is also so overtly and explicitly religious. There's nature in there, lots of nature, but it's a collection of poetry that, where she writes with striking passion about her Christian faith. She's an Episcopalian, and she writes poems addressed to God and she writes of the Eucharist, and she writes of wanting to see Jesus. And she writes about Palm Sunday and Jesus praying in the Garden of Gethsemane. And it was so striking to have this collections of, of water snake and goldenrod and iris and poppies, and then all of a sudden this explosion of theology or, or of Christian theology. Another surprise I came across that year was a series of poems she wrote about her dog, Percy. Linda read the first Percy poem earlier in the service, which she then expanded into a whole series called Dog Songs, containing only poems about dogs. And the book is as joyful as you can possibly imagine it would be. Here is the first poem in that collection. How it begins. A puppy is a puppy is a puppy. <laughs> he's probably in a basket with a bunch of other puppies. Then he's a little older and he's nothing but a bundle of longing. He doesn't even understand it. Then someone picks him up and says, I want this one. <clears throat> Thank you. 
what does it say about us that so many of you use not only love or poetry, but worship? Worship with it, with awe and adoration. My colleague, Reverend Victoria Weinstein, actually did some doctoral work, and it included an exploration of the role of Mary Oliver's poetry, the role that it plays in Unitarian Universalist spirituality and worship. I'm going to gloss over what she writes a little bit, uh, but it informs me. But you'll, you'll love this. Uh, the title of, the title of her, her paper about Mary Oliver and UU worship is There's Something About Mary. <laughs> I'm all about the catchy titles. <laughs> What's striking to Reverend Dr. Weinstein and striking to me is that over her entire body of work, 27 volumes spanning more than 50 years, there are so many things that either never or almost never appear in any of her poems. There are no cities, no urban or even suburban landscapes. With the exception of her dearly beloved Molly, there are no other people. Friends, neighbors, and strangers do not populate these poems. Even in her religious poetry, there's church but no congregation, communion but no priest, faith but no community. There is no history. There is, for the most part, no reference to other poets or other books, though her dog does eat a copy of the Bhagavad Gita. But that's really about it. We don't know, really, what she reads or listens to. There are no cultures. Nationalities do not appear in her poems. Race does not appear. It's striking to me that Mary Oliver's first volume of poetry was published the year after Rachel Carson's Silent Spring, which chronicled the ravages of pesticides and pollution on the ecosystem. And Mary Oliver wrote five decades of nature poetry, but largely absent, largely absent from her work is any mention of ecology, environmentalism, endangered species, extinction, and when she does bring it up, she brings it up so fleetingly. Here in its entirety is the only ecological poem of hers that I could find. It is a poem where the title is 14 words and the poem itself is 20 words. The title, Watching a Documentary about polar bears trying to survive on the melting ice floes. In the poem. That God had a plan I do not doubt, but what if his plan was that we would do better? In the readings earlier in the service, I chose three Mary Oliver poems that are lesser known. One about her faith as a Christian, which appears in just a few of her poems. One of her Percy poems displaying her humor and levity. And the third poem I selected, Up in the Empire, is what I believe to be Mary Oliver's most political poem. And they will say that this structure was held together politically, which it was. And they will say also that our politics was no more than an apparatus to accommodate the feelings of the heart. And that the heart, in those days, was small and hard and full of meanness. I say all this not to criticize her. All of those things that I mentioned, community and 
society and neighbors and friends and people and politics, they just do not seem to be a part of her project. And I do love her poetry. I love the summer day and wild geese and the Blackwater Woods and the journey. I love the Percy poems. And it is in no way fair to criticize based on omission. And so I return to the question of why we are drawn to her poetry. And I wonder, I wonder if part of that reason, I wonder if part of that reason if in her sparseness, not natural sparseness, because she, she describes the natural world in great detail, but in such a, such a focus, I wonder if those poems actually give us permission to bring the fullness of our lives with all of our relationships and responsibilities, with all of our joys and our sorrows, with all of our concerns, with all of our heartbreak, with all of our political feelings. I wonder if her poetry gives us a place to bring all of that and her poems somehow are spacious enough for us to kind of hold ourselves with all of that. And I wonder if in her poetry she provides a space for us to kind of to kind of give all of that up for a time, for the time that we're with that poem. To sit and to be and to notice. And that is a wonderful gift. I want to offer, conclude this uh, reflection on the poetry of Mary Oliver with um, one poem of hers, which is the last poem in her last published collection, Felicity. It, is, it was underneath there, or else that would have been really awkward. <laughs> it's a poem that stands alone, all by itself, in her last book. And it's written as a dialogue. The poem is called A Voice from I Don't Know Where. And it's this voice, possibly from outside, possibly from within, speaking, and her responding. And I offer you it to you, it to you because I think it is just a wonderful summary of her. It begins with the voice. It seems you love this world very much. Yes, I said, this beautiful world. And you don't mind the mind that keeps you busy all the time with its dark and bright wonderings? No, I'm quite used to it. Busy, busy all the time. And you don't mind living with those questions, I mean the hard ones, that no one can answer. Actually, they're the most interesting. <clears throat> and you have a person in your life whose hand you like to hold. Yes, I do. It must surely, then, be very happy down there in your heart. Yes, I said, it is. Amen. And thank you to St. Mary, <laughs> the Church of Nature, for the blessing of your poetry. <clears throat> With that, we're going to sing our closing hymn of the morning. It's number 1007. There's a river flowing in my soul. Afterwards, um, Linda's going to read The Wild Geese, which is um, one of Mary Oliver's best known and most loved, and I invite you to, to uh, sit back down for that. But, but now we're going to rise for There's a River